Woe to you, scribes, and you Pharisees, you hypocrites. Why are they hypocrites and why is woe spoken over them? By the way, what's a Pharisee or a scribe? They are the religious elite. They're impure in their preaching. They're impure in their teaching. They're impure in their shepherding. They're impure in their counseling. They do their church growth models so that they can be validated by men. And all the while they're saying it's so I can win souls to God. No, it's not. Everybody tracking? The thing that the Lord has really been burdening me with a lot lately is purity. I think about it all the time. I pray for it all the time. I pursue it all the time. I cry out for it all the time. I long for it in His people all the time. Is a pure heart. I think about purity all the time. I don't know why. Praise God. <laughs> it's weighty because when you realize how impure you are all the time, it's weighty, but it should be the pursuit of our heart is for purity before a holy God. Because believe it or not, there is extremity of power in purity. There is power in purity. And even like with the hot mess that just broke out in this church over the last four months and stuff like that, my constant prayer was, I don't care what's going on. I don't care the mocking, the scoffing, the reviling, the false witness, the lies, the breathing out, the plots and the schemes and blah, blah, blah. Whatever. Let them do whatever they think is right to do. Let them do whatever they think is good in their own eyes to do. Let them do it. God, guard my heart to purity. I want to be pure. I know you're examining my meditations. You know my inner monologue. You know if I'm cursing, if I'm slandering, if I'm maligning, if I'm vengeancing, if I'm bittering, if I'm angering, if I'm malicing. You know, like I'm hiding anything from you. You can act all meek and humble you want on the outside and, oh, I have self-control. I'm not saying it out loud. The Lord knows what's in your heart. And he wants a pure heart. He wants a humble and contrite heart. He will not despise a humble and contrite heart. This is a man who I esteem, him who is humble and contrite and trembles at my word. His word says, no impure man, no impure man ought to think he has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. Do you think purity is a little bit significant? Very significant. And I go, oh God, just keep my heart pure. In the deepest thought, in little interactions here or there, little conversations here and there, whatever it is, my internal monologue, my eyes, my meditations, a critical spirit, a judgmental spirit, blah, 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 whatever it is. Oh God, purify me, create in me a pure heart, oh God, a pure heart. I know that that's the only thing that you value. He doesn't care about your activity. Activity means nothing if it's impure. So that's what's been on my heart. So literally this morning before church, I think I got eight pages in this morning before church. I was like, <laughs> so. So it may be a little bit discombobulated, but we'll get the idea, right? We're talking about purity, purity this morning. Because there's so much power in it. The Greek word for pure in Matthew 5, 8, by the way, is blessed are the pure in, pure in heart. Pure in heart for what? For they will see God. Do you think there is power in purity? Blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. It is so powerful and nobody's ever talking about it. When you say purity, they go, don't look at porn. That, I mean, that's literally what they've reduced purity to is looking at sexual immorality. Yeah, that is an impurity. That's not what it's talking about. That is an aspect of purity. That is not the definition of purity. See how everything's been reduced? Remember, we were talking about moving the boundary stones, how the church has systematically moved the boundary stones, boundary stones even on language. Contained within the scriptures? I digress. Okay. The Greek word for pure. And Matthew 5, 8. Katharos is what it means. And it means to be clean, blameless, and unstained from guilt. It specifically, actually, in the original context, is referring to something being transformed or purified or maybe being clean, blameless, and unstained by guilt through fire or pruning. 
That's the two things in particular that that word used there, katharos, is being used to, to mean blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. John the Baptist told us that Jesus would baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire, Matthew 3.11. And Malachi 3 speaks of the Messiah as being a refiner's fire. And then we're told in John 15 how Christ Jesus is the one that prunes. And even those who bear fruit, what does he do? He prunes you even more so that you bear even more fruit. He's literally saying, my entirety of who I am in your life is to make you pure. He is coming for a church whose dress is spotless, blameless, pure, without fault. It is the centrality of his focus is purity, purity of heart, purity of heart, purity of heart, purity in all things, purity of intentions. And notice what the definition of pure or the Greek translation of pure did not speak to was perfection. I'm going to try to make that distinction. Purity does not mean perfection. Purity means purity. It means free from guilt. It means that you're clean. It means that you're blameless. And I can go, oh God, I'm a total idiot. Am I pure or corrupted? I'm pure. I'm totally pure. Oh God, I really wanted to love that person well and I completely blew it. You're pure. It was a pure heart. Oh God, I did this. Oh God, I did that. Oh God, against you and you alone, I'm saying. The fact that I'm even coming forward in that is testifying to a period of heart that my every heart's desire is actually to bless you and I blew it and I fell so short, so in purity I'm confessing because he who confesses his sin, he's faithful and just to heal you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So even the act of confession and repentance and the experience of the conviction and then moving out in response to the conviction by faith It's testifying to a heart that's pure. Did everybody hear that? Purity does not equal perfection, period. Now the Lord says, perfect holiness out of reverence for Christ. He says, you pursue purity. We'll get into some scriptures. He says, you seek it, you pursue it, you drive for it because blessed are those who are pure in heart for they will see God. The Greek word for heart in Matthew 5 is kardia. And this can be applied to our physical heart, but more importantly, refers to the spiritual center of our lives. So when it says, blessed are the pure in heart, so blessed are the clean, blameless, unstained from guilt of heart. It's saying, blessed are the clean, blameless, unstained from guilt, spiritual center of your life where your thoughts and your desires and your sense of purpose and your will and your understanding and your character reside. So to be pure in heart actually means that what you are is pure. It's the essence of who you are. Blessed are those who are this. They just are. That's what they are. And notice what it said, that they're unstained from guilt. If you are in Christ Jesus, what are you? What are you? You are unstained by guilt. Your sins have been removed from you as far as the east is from the west. So your sins were as crimson, he's made them white as snow. Anyone who confesses is he's faithful and just to cleanse you and wash you of all unfaith. You are clean. You are blameless. Praise be to God. He's more than able to present you before the Father blameless and with great joy. To the only God, our Father, be all glory and honor, praise and dominion, both now and forevermore. Book of Jude. It's saying the same thing all the time. That this is who you are because this is who I am. And this will be the testimony that you actually have a regenerate heart. So if your heart's desire is not purity, maybe you better test yourself to see if you're of the faith. Unless, of course, you fail the test. Unless you're scared you're going to fail the test. See, it's actually the mercy of God to challenge you to test to see if you're of the faith. Because our hearts are so impure that we can convince ourselves of anything before a holy God. And the whole time, our hearts are totally impure. Being pure in heart means to have a singleness of heart towards God. A heart that has no hypocrisy, no guile, and no hidden motives. If there's anything that I've borne witness to in the last 10 years of being in ministry is how impure most people's hearts are their motives, their language, 
why they serve, why they don't serve, the false brethren that speak well of you. What did he say to Jeremiah? Be careful of all those who speak well of you. They're lying to you. They have ulterior motives. Be weary of those who do this. Be weary of the blah, 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 blah. Like they're not pure. They're not even pure in their religion. He says, and this is the religion that is pure and undefiled, right? Like he gives us all, he's constantly speaking to us and says, so few are pure. Why? Because their hearts are deceitfully wicked above all things. Who can even understand it? On their best day and their best motives, there are usually all kinds of weird hidden motives and hypocrisies and guile and schemes and plots and passive manipulations and emotionally predatory things. And they're maneuvering and manipulating and they're using language or they're feigning victim or they're feigning strength or they're feigning whatever. It's all fakery because they're not pure. See, a pure heart is a humble heart and a contrite heart, not a perfect heart, not a squared away heart. It's not devoid of hot messiness, spicy disasterness. You can use that for the rest of my life. It's not devoid of that stuff. A pure heart is right smack in the middle of it that goes, I know exactly what I am and I have nothing to hide. I know exactly what I am but I know exactly who he is at the exact same time. I know that both are true at the same time. I know the chasm between me and a holy God. I know it. That's why I magnify Christ Jesus who spans that chasm. Because the longer I walk with the Lord, the more I'm aware of his holiness. The more I know his word, the more I'm aware of his holiness. The more I seek his face, the more I'm aware of his holiness. The longer I walk with the Lord, the more I'm aware of my depravity. I'm aware of my double-mindedness. I'm aware of my carnality. The longer I walk with the Lord, I don't feel more and more holy. The longer I walk with the Lord, I feel more and more a wretch. Are you kidding me? I'm only ever increasingly aware of how short I fall of the amazing wonders of the grace and mercy and holiness of God. And so as the, as the longer I walk with the Lord, this chasm gets wider, wider, wider. And then Christ gets exalted and magnified bigger and bigger and bigger the longer you walk with the Lord. And you realize the majesty of just walking in purity and simplicity and humility of heart. You can always tell when somebody is impure. They'll use really fancy language. I know I try to. That's because I'm impure and I have a speech impediment. No, I'm kidding. But yeah, they'll, hide, they'll use doctrine or they'll use theology or they'll use bents or biases or they'll use Gnosticism, knowledge. They'll use uh, uh, um, emotional manipulation through hyper-friendliness, hyper-servitude, hyper-whatever. And all of it is a ploy to guile other people. They have impure motives, even in their relationships. And the craziest thing is, I know we talked about it I can't remember what sermon it was. I want to go back and re-listen re to it because there was awesome word in there about how we are always actually actively manipulating God as if we can bend his emotion to our will. We pray louder. We pray more emphatically. We make uh, concessions with God. We barter. We do all kinds of things before a holy God because we're impure. And whether we say it or not, he knows the secret intents of our hearts and all of it's going to be laid bare. We're like, P I see it all the time. You know how I see it? Because then their faith gets shipwrecked. They make these negotiations with God. I'm going to do this for you, God, but then you're going to repay me, right? You're, you're going to... And they will never, they usually can't even articulate it. They don't know that that's what they're doing. That's how impure their motives are. I am going to restrain myself or I am going to serve over here. I'm going to, by the strength of my will, grit my teeth and endure over here, persevere over here. They're doing all these bartering things with God, thinking that they can manipulate God to bend, to bend his will to their emotional preference. And when he doesn't, they balk. That's how you can tell they were impure. Actually, we can tell how they're impure because Scripture gives us the algorithm for it. Wherever there's selfish ambition or envy, there you'll find disorder in every evil practice. So when I see somebody whose spirit's in disorder, I go, what is the selfish ambition that's at the root of your heart that you're not aware of? Or where is there an envy at the root of your heart that you're not aware of? Because you're chaotic. Your thoughts are chaotic. Your emotions are chaotic. 
There, there's so, your marriage is chaotic. Your children are chaotic. Your relationships are chaotic. Your money management is chaotic. Your life is chaotic. So I know biblically that there is something impure that you are walking in that you're not even aware of because the fruit says wherever there is selfish ambition or envy, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. There's disorder. It's got to be either envy or selfish ambition. I don't know. We got to peel back the layers till we figure it out. See how it works? And this is going on all the time while we're completely unaware of it. Being pure involves having a singleness of heart to just want to bless him. That's why I get so tired of people praying for blessing. Like, when's the last time you blessed the Lord? When's the last time you blessed the name of his son, Jesus? If anybody's shared a meal with us and our family, we bless the Lord. We say, and we bless the name of Jesus Christ. We bless the Father. We bless the Lord. Our desire is to bless the Lord in all things. That's a pure heart. And so when your heart is pure and you have a signal of mind to bless the Lord and be a blessing to the Lord, not to receive blessing from the Lord, you don't care about being exposed. You don't have hidden motives. What you see is what you get. The good, the bad, the ugly, the regenerate, the beautiful, the wonderful, the awesome, the gross, the nasty, the whatever. You just, this is what it is. I just want to bless the Lord. I don't like that those things are in me. I don't like that I'm capable of those things. I don't like that I touch that or touch these unclean things. I don't want it because I want my life to be a blessing to the Lord. Let my life be a love song as that song goes. Just sing to you. I want my life to be a worship song to you, God. See, so you can walk in period of heart even when the perfection doesn't quite meet, match up to it. Matthew 23, 25 and through 26 says this, Woe to you, scribes, and you Pharisees, you hypocrites. Why are they hypocrites and why is woe spoken over them? By the way, what's a Pharisee or a scribe? They are the religious elite. They are the highest form of religious do-gooderism. Pharisees and scribes are the religious elite. And he says, woe to you, you scribes, you Pharisees, you hypocrites. Why? For you clean the outside of the, cu of the cup or the plate, but inside you're actually full of greed and self-indulgence. They will be lovers of self. They'll be full of conceit, proud, boastful, arrogant, treacherous, rash. They'll have the form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. Why? Because their form of godliness is impure. It's impure. And he goes, that same thing is what I'm speaking over the Pharisees and the scribes. The uns the, you think it's about the outside of the cup. I know what's in your heart. Greed and self-indulgence. He says, you blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup, purify the heart, purify the heart, that the outside may also be clean. Hebrews 4, 12 through 13 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of the soul and spirit and joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. The word is judging your heart. It's searching it out for purities and impurities. It's building up purities. It's reducing impurities. The word has a singular purpose. That is to judge the attitudes and the thoughts of your heart. To make it pure. It says nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Why in the world do you think you can manipulate God? With your emotions or your thoughts or your words. Like just fake words, just empty words. That's the definition of vanity. It's the definition of hypocrisy. Like you can outmaneuver God's knowing. And he goes, my word is actually searching what's in your heart. The attitudes and the thoughts of it to see if it's pure. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to who you must give an account. Why wouldn't you pursue a pure heart in every way? First Timothy 5, 24 through 25 says, The sins of some are obvious, reaching their place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them. I've told people all because they're like, you're this, you're that, you're this, you're that, you're that. I'm like, I know. You're, I know. 
You're totally right. I am absolutely that. Actually, you're not saying anything that I'm not aware of. Actually, you're speaking to something that I've been praying for, praying through for years. Pray for me in that. You're absolutely right. That's exactly what I am. Aren't you glad that my sins are out in front of me and you can see them for what they are? I'd, I'd take that guy any day over a guy whose sins come after him because they've been hidden, because he can manipulate reality, because he's a smooth talker, because he's whatever. I'm like, what you see is what you get. There's nothing else going on behind closed doors. There's nothing else going on inside my mind. There's nothing else coming into my eyes that nobody else knows about. There's no secret hidden intents in my heart. What you see is what you get. I want to be pure before the Lord. I'm not concerned about being pure before you. I want to be pure before the Lord. So there's nothing hidden that's not going to be disclosed. Why would I not just let it out? So I can do business with a holy God and in purity confess and repent and worship. And then guess what? About three seconds later, confess, repent, and then worship. And then confess and repent and then worship. And maintain a pure heart before a holy God. The sins of some are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them. And the same way good deeds are obvious, and even those are not obvious, cannot remain hidden forever. He says it's all going to be laid bare. It's all going to be laid bare. A false purity is a false security. A false purity is a false security. And you know why most people tend to walk in a false purity? Because of their pride. Their pride. That's why the Lord said a humble and contrite heart. This is a man who I esteem. Him who is humble and contrite and trembles at my word. A broken and contrite heart you will not despise, O Lord. A heart that's mourning and grieving, hating the very clothing stained by sin, God, you won't like. But a prideful heart walks in faulty purity, which then gives them a faulty sense of security. I've seen it so many times. Serving. Oh my goodness. Do you know how many people, how often, and especially you see it a lot of times in family members, serve, 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 serve. They're always serving, always serving, always serving. You want to know why? Because they want you to affirm them for serving. It's not pure. They show up so that you can't say, why weren't they there? It's impure. They clean so that somebody will notice them clean so that they can't say they didn't help clean. It's impure. Everything they do is impure. It is a faulty purity, which gives them a faulty sense of security. And the whole time the Lord's going, unacceptable, 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 unacceptable. That will not be accredited to you. That will not be attributed to you. It is impure. So many, it says, greedy for unjust gain. They fabricate stories. They're impure in their preaching. They're impure in their teaching. They're impure in their shepherding. They're impure in their counseling. They do their church growth models so that they can be validated by men. And all the while they're saying it's so I can win souls to God. No, it's not. I know because I talk to the pastors. As they're saying, my whole goal is if I can show how successful, success, bleh, I've been with this church and how much I've grown it that then I'll be invited to be at district for the denomination. Really? So I thought you were evangelizing your community. Impure, 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 impure all the time, all the time. And it gives them this false sense of security. And that's why, what, why do we do such a typically a pretty long call to worship? Because I love you. And I do not want a single one of you to bring an impure offering of thanksgiving to the Lord. That's why. I'm concerned for you and I'm concerned for me. I'm concerned for the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to move freely through this place that we would come with an impurity. So I was seeing this like, like, I, I'm sorry I came with my agenda. I'm sorry I just sang another song. I'm sorry I just paid you lip service. Oh, I did this for you, God. I did this for you, God. Lord, 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 Lord. Away from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. Not only do I not know you, everything that you did in my name was so impure, you actually worked iniquity for yourself. See how relevant purity is before the Lord? Think of purity in praying. You hear it all the time. People pray because they want to be heard praying. They pray very lofty prayers, very theologically dense prayers, and then their hearts are so corrupted. I know, I just saw it with these men that obliterated our church. Impure, all the time, 
Always an agenda, always a thing. When am I gonna be validated? When am I gonna be exalted? Like everything is super impure, but all the while they go, I'm your brother, I'm your brother. I just want honor the Lord, I just want, no you don't. No you don't. Humility and contrition is a pure heart. Humility and contrition, not power and pride and arrogancy and hypocrisy and false witness and slandering and malice and undermining and usurping and power plays. All the while, all your language looks perfectly polished to everybody around you. See, some men sin goes before him. Some's going to come after him. It's all going to be exposed. Why would you even do that? Why don't you just say, listen, I'm an arrogant jerk and I really don't like you. And actually, I want to take what you have. I'd go, cool. That was super pure. I know exactly what we got to work with. I wouldn't balk at that. You know what I would say? Because I do say it to people. I go, that's cool. That doesn't surprise me. That's fine. We can navigate that. So that's where we're at. That's not where we're going to stay. I, that's awesome. Praise God. That was pure of heart. Blessed. Bless. You're blessed for saying. You're blessed. Like you're, God's grace is upon you because you're humble. You can go, this is what I am. This is where I'm at. Praise God. What, what, why the beguiling? Why the plotting? Why the scheming? Why the admit? Why? And the worst thing of all is the manipulation of the word of God to manipulate the spirit of God and manipulate the word of God to justify your carnality. Why? Just say, this is where I'm at. At least we can walk with it together in the grace and mercy and loving kindness of God. Just deal with it. Dude, I'm totally, I know I'm, I know I'm on your board or I'm on your whatever, but I'm actually looking at porn all the time. Praise God, you confessed it. Now we can work. Now we can get to work. But if there's no pure in heart, impurities, if there's impurities, it says they ought not think they have an inheritance in the kingdom of heaven. You are so faulty. Remember I said, what did I say? I don't remember what I said, but I say a, a false purity is a false security. You have a false purity because when you're impure, it says, don't even think, don't even consider that you have an inheritance in the kingdom of heaven. Do you think it's a big deal? On a personal note, one of the things for me about purity that I will never say this is just me, but I'm never as self-exalting. I'm just sharing my, my reality intimately. I will never bless somebody for sneezing. I think that that is an anathema to a holy God to say, bless you. How dare you use that language in such an impure way? I will never, I have never once blessed somebody for sneezing. There's another thing I will never do. I will never, it's a personal conviction. I will never say to somebody, I'll pray for you about that if I know that I'm not going to. I actually pray before telling somebody I'll pray for them to make sure that I'm pure in my language and my speech on whether or not I'm actually gonna walk it out. I don't want Christianese lip service because the Lord is looking at my heart. All the time. I don't want any Christian easily lip service. I will not say anything that I know is not pure from my heart just to say it because it's a pleasantry or it's a social norm or it's a social expectation. We talked about passive manipulations. It's one of my favorite ones. Everybody knows like the, my most favorite form of impurity is feigned victimhood to accomplish what we, what somebody wants to accomplish in the other person. It's my, most favorite form of impurity because they always get a pass because they're so impure that they strategically manipulate your emotion to always go poor baby poor baby poor you poor you and everything about their language and speech and conduct is totally impure they're actually parasitically manipulating you to get attention on themselves from you they're parasites they're vampires they're spiritual and emotional vampires and it comes to passive manipulation, usually through Christianese language to take from you to have things put on themselves. They are lovers of self, treacherous, rash, full of conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They want to feel better about themselves, so they make you affirm them. I know people are like, all they want to do is like encourage, 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 encourage. And I said, how come you're always encouraging people like that? I mean, that's cool. That's awesome. I think it's super cool. And it's like, because they encourage me back. And I go, dude, are you kidding me? None of that will be attributed to you. That is the most impure thing I've ever heard. You are literally affirming people and encouraging them so they'll do it back to you. Just stop. Just stop. 
That is so gross. And you're going to be held accountable. Nothing, there's nothing hidden that's not going to be disclosed. Nothing hidden. How gross. Purity. Faulty repentance. Worldly sorrow versus godly sorrow. Emotionally predatory actions. So much impurity all around us. We talked about purity and the fact that all wisdom can only come from a pure heart. People go, I'm praying for wisdom. I'm praying for wisdom. I'm praying for wisdom. I'm praying for wisdom. Okay, let's stop at praying for wisdom. Let's back up and let's get to the root of wisdom. I'll read it to you. James 3, 13 through 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility. Oh, there it is again. That comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, in your where? Do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. How's that for a powerful scripture that nobody wants to operate? Wherever there is bitter envy or jealousy, that's not the wisdom of the world. Oh, I'm being prudent. I'm being shrewd. I'm being, no, actually you're unspiritual, worldly, and demonic. Biblically speaking, there's no way around it. For where there is selfish ambition or envy, there you will find disorder in every evil practice. The language is so strong. It's so strong. But the wisdom from above is first of all, anybody? Pure. First. It must be pure first. The wisdom from above is first of all pure. It must come from purity. Wherever there's impurity, there is no wisdom because there's a selfish ambition. Or there's an, Maybe your selfish ambition is to get what you want. Your selfish ambition is to lord over. Your selfish ambition is to be validated. Your selfish ambition is to use somebody else as your emotional will be and your healing balm. Your selfish ambition is money, power, validation. Maybe your selfish ambition is comfort to be totally left alone. Maybe there's envy. I want what you have, but I want it on the cheap. I want God's touch on your life, on my life. I want this, blah, blah, blah. I want... What, dude, it's all over the place. It's crazy. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure. First of all. Then, then peace loving, considerate and submissive and full of mercy and good fruit. It's impartial. It's sincere. And peacemakers who sow in peace will reap a harvest of righteousness. But it must first of all be pure. You remove the purity, no wisdom. So you could have a, you could look considerate, you could look submissive, you could look merciful, you could mo- look like you have a good life, you could look like you're sincere and impartial, and all the time there is an impurity in your heart, and you're actually like data collecting, or you're pulling in information, or you want to be the go-to guy that that people want counseling from, or whatever it is, it's all impure because wisdom is first of all pure. Then those other things come, and when you flip flop it. No impure man ought to think he has an inheritance in the kingdom of heaven because you're lying about God to God's face. You're saying, you don't see, you don't know, I'm getting one over you. Aha. That's what you're saying. You couldn't get more impure than that. Then the feign as if God doesn't know what's actually going on in your heart and mind. You are telling him to his face that he's a liar to his face as you're proclaiming his name to everybody else around you. Insane, right? I'll give that qualifier. 1 Timothy 1, 3-7, all these verses talk about the basic conduct of a Christian calling an election that reproves a generate heart. As I urge you when I went to Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people to not teach false doctrines any longer. Or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Has anybody seen the Christian truther movement, of which I'm a part of? Arguments, endless genealogies, mythos, you name it. Tell them to stop talking about those things. They're out of whack. They're all over the place. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart. 
The only reason why I'm rebuking you, the only reason why I'm admonishing you, the only reason why I'm dressing these things is because I love you from a pure heart. That's why I'm going to tell you these things. Because I love you. And it's okay if it causes a little bit of offense or a little bit of a rub or a little bit of pushback. It's okay. I'm only telling you from a pure heart. What the purity of the heart is, what I care about more than anything than your emotions and how you're going to mock me, scoff me, revile me, slander me or whatever. What I care about more than that is you're standing before a holy God. So if that's the foundation with which I'm speaking to you, I'm coming at you with a pure heart. You may not like it, but I'm telling you my heart is pure before a holy God. I'm actually only concerned about your standing before him. That's why I'm going to address these things. That's why I'm going to lead a wife, even though she may be warring or jezebel ish I'm not saying that about my wife. I'm saying that, you know, that number one thing I hear about, weak, complacent men. Weak, complacent men. Always feigning strength and power and MMA and golfing and blah, blah. all these things that they think to find manhood. Yet their wife rules the home. Their wife basically emotionally abuses them every day. Their wife lords everything over them and they won't lead them because their heart is not pure and they don't care about their wife standing before a holy God. See, if they understood that their wife standing before a holy God is impure because of their warring spirit, because they're subjected to the curse in Genesis 3, that they're grieving the Lord, they're grieving the spirit of living, they're grieving their testimony, they're grieving the testimony of the household, then into the pure heart, a truly pure heart, a husband who has a pure heart before the Lord and wants to bless him would come for his wife and draw her out of that because he's concerned about her standing before a holy God, not the dynamics within the marriage. That's so secondary. He's concerned about his wife standing so in love, he rightly pursues her with a pure heart to lead her out, to wash her with the word, to make a pure, spotless, and blameless, a radiant wife before a holy God. That's what he would do if his heart was pure. Or he could just be a lover of self and a lover of pleasure. And that is super displeasurable to go enter into that hot mess again because she's going to yell at me and blah, 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 and withhold her body from me and do this and blah, blah, blah. So it just ain't worth it. I'll leave her to it. No purity. No purity. This is Christian men all the time, right? 1 Timothy 4.12, the command was from the Apostle Paul to Timothy, let no one look down on you on your youthfulness, but rather in speech and conduct, love and faith, and in purity, show yourself an example to those who believe. You could, I could talk to you guys all day long about conduct, love, and faith. Could I, could I not? I could orate. What's orating do? Nothing. It's powerless. I could orate all day long. If I don't have purity behind the conduct, all this for nothing. It's a vain thing, chasing after the wind. Purity is what holds out all that together. Titus 2, 7 through 8. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works and in your teaching show purity and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame and have nothing evil to say about you. Impurity, impurity, impurity. It's all centered around it. Second Corinthians 11, one through three. I wish you would bear with me a little longer. Do bear with me for I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin before Christ. But I'm afraid that just as the serpent deceived Eve by his coming, your thoughts have been led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. See, Apostle Paul speaking again. I have this burden. I have a divine jealousy for you to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But somebody is deceiving you just like Eve was deceived in the garden to take you away from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. I could do that in all kinds of ways. I could tell you it's about your Bible translation. I could tell you it's about how you were baptized and when you were baptized. I could tell you that's about what day you go to church and honor God and what day you don't go to church. And I, I could tell you it's about the feast days. I could tell you about what it's eat and what you don't eat. I can tell you all kinds of things and I can fabricate doctrines of demons to lead the masses astray and bring the way in the disrepute. Has anybody heard every church denomination on the face of the planet within there? And I can lead you astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. What's a sincere and pure devotion to Christ? Man, 
Amazing grace, how sweet thou art that saved a wretch like me. That's sincere, pure devotion to Christ. I know what I was. I know your grace. Take my whole life. Let it be a blessing to you. There's your religion. No, it's do and don't do. This and that, dot and tittle. Dot the I's, cross the J's. Do this, do that, 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 do this. And then you'll have a right standing with God. Nope, somebody deceived you from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. That's my fear. That's why I get so hardcore on Torah observance. That's why I go so hard at NAR and Bethel and Hillsong. That's why I go so hard at the counterfeit charismatic. Not authentic, there's authentic charismatics, but the counterfeit charismatic. That's why I go so hard at the emergent church and the social justice gospel and the seeker friendly church. And the way I go so hard because they're deceiving people away from the sincere and pure devotion to Christ. They're being deceived away and they're having yoke after yoke after yoke after yoke after burden put back onto them by the false teachers and false teachers that have brought the way of truth into disrepute. That's why I go so hard at it. Proverbs 22, 11 says, drive out the mocker and out goes strife. Quarrels and insults are ended. One who loves a pure heart and who speaks with grace will have the king for a friend. One who loves a pure heart and speaks with grace will have the king for a friend. It's such a big deal. Because a pure heart is a trustworthy heart. A pure heart is a confidence-worthy heart. Think of Joseph. Think of Daniel. Think of Esther. Think of whatever. They just came in a pure heart. They said things they didn't want to hear. They interpreted dreams that they didn't want to interpret it that way. They, but they were a pure heart and they were like, you have me as your friend. Nebuchadnezzar to whoever. And Belshazzar to whoever. And Xerxes to whoever. And Darius and Cyrus to whoever. You have the king as a friend because your heart is pure. Your heart is pure. Yeah, you're saying things I don't want to hear. You're saying things I don't like, but I know that it's a purity of heart. And you're a trustworthy man or woman because of that. The power of purity. The power of purity is so radically significant. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So what's the opposite? Cursed are the impure in heart, because they'll never get to see his face. Impurity. Purity is where holiness and joy come together. Purity is the ultimate comprehensive blessedness of the believer. It is the great culmination of all that will actually be described to you as blessed. Look at the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, blessed, 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 blessed. And the thing that binds it all together that actually gives you the assurance of the hope is the pure in heart. Blessed are they, blessed are you, blessed are they, blessed are you, blessed are you. But the pure in heart that's the culmination of all that they're going to see the face of God. Everybody understand how big a deal it is? When we are inwardly pure, not perfect, but pure, we testify that we are actually fully submitted to the gospel. A gospel that is undefiled and uncorrupted by the malintents of my own manipulating heart. That's what it testifies to. True Christianity, an authentic, regenerate heart, lies in a heart that is pure. Psalm 24, 3 through 6. Who may ascend on the mountain of, of the Lord? Who may stand in the holy place? Okay, so he gives the question. Now he gives the answer. The one who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false God. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek Him, who seek His face, God of Jacob. That's who. Who, who gets to be in His holy place? Who gets to be in His presence? He said, the one whose hands are clean and so is their heart. Their heart is pure. That's who. A pure heart is a heart that is free from mixture, it is actually in direct opposition to mixture. Like any other solution or substrate in the natural, purity is always the goal. You want wine unmixed. You want water unmuddied. You want sustenance unpolluted by the GMOs and the chemtrails and blah, blah, blah. You want pure, undefiled things that you take into your body. You don't want a mixture. 
That's what God kept speaking over Israel. You're mingling the Holy Seed. You're mixing the Holy Seed. You're mixing this. You're pulling in foreign gods. You're wanting to look like the nations around you. You're wanting cultural relevance. You're going the way of the Nicolaitans. You're running after Balaam's heir. You've tolerated that Jezebel. See, you're mixing things. In fact, the singularity of the end of the age is all about a great mixing. Daniel 4, right? Is it Daniel 4? Daniel 2. The mixing the miry clay and the iron will try to cleave, will try to mix, and they can't because you're polluting what God created pure. They want to mix the genetics. They want to mix the water. They want to mix it all to remove the purity in every single way. 2 Corinthians 6 says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can there be between light and darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Belial is a derivative of Baal, of pagan Luciferian worship. Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of living God. Listen, you can't commingle. You just can't. He's looking for a pure heart. A pure heart. Not a perfect heart. A pure heart. Oh God. Oh God. Search me and see if there's any unclean thing in me. And lead me in your way everlasting, oh Lord. See if there's any impurities in me. Not the Nicolaitans. Not the anything. Uh, not those who swear by both Christ and Belial. As in Zephaniah 1, not the Nicolaitans that God warns about in Revelation 2, because you've gone away the Nicolaitans, which by the way, study that out. It is disgusting because it is an exact mirror of the seeker-friendly church growth model. That's what the Nicolaitans were doing. It's crazy when you dig into it. It is, we are an exact replica of what the Nicolaitans, it was about reducing the gospel adding all kinds of tolerance and hyper grace so that they could be relevant to the culture around them to advance the gospel. That's what the Nicolaitans were doing. Purity. Purity can only come by faith. That's why David cries out in Psalm 51, create in me a forgiven heart, create in me a highly sanctified heart, create in me what? Create in me a pure heart, oh God. That was murder and adultery. I just committed murder. I just committed adultery. And what he wanted and what he knew, the only thing that would be acceptable was that his heart would be made pure again. Clean me, oh Lord, and I'll be clean. Wash me, oh Lord, and I'll be washed. Create in me a pure heart, oh God. Do not take your presence from me. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Create in me this pure heart once again, God, and renew a right spirit within me. Renew it, God. Singularity of his focus was that his heart would be pure. He was an adulterer. He was a murderer. Was. Did you hear? Was. That's not who he is. That's what he did. Purify my heart. Clean me and I'll be clean, O oh Lord. And he knew he could come freely into the Lord's presence boldly for all of his life, including all of eternity because of the sufficiency of God. David was not perfect, but he was pure. He was a man after God's own heart. Purity is the great final act of the culmination of all human history. Did you know that? Okay, and then I'll read some verses. Ephesians 5. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, for such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Do not be deceived. For because of such things, God's wrath is coming upon all the disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. It says, here's the culmination. He's going to judge by purity. He's coming to judge according to purity. And no impurity ought to think they have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. Hebrews 12, 14 through 17. Strive for peace with everyone and for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and that 
By it, many may be defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterwards, when he desired, desired to enter his blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. He says, strive, strive for peace with everyone and for holiness, for a purity of your heart for without it, no one will see the Lord. That's how significant it is. It's the culmination of everything, is this purity and this pursuit of purity to honor the Lord. Malachi 3, 1 through 4, I will send a messenger, this is talking about the end of the age, who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring an offer in righteousness. And the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will finally be acceptable to the Lord as in the days gone by. He's like, when I come, I'm coming to purify because nothing impure can be in my presence. I'm coming to sit as a purifier, like a refiner's fire or like a launder soap to purify my people. Then we come home. Ah, I was going to start breaking into rapture. It'll just distract from the message. That's why I never talk about it openly. It just is such a distraction. To, Going back to, I fear that someone has deceived you. Just as a serpent deceived Eden, Eve in the garden, somebody has deceived you from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Rapture. They make it about the doctrine, not about the king, not about the resurrection, not about the, they make it about this, not about that. Make, sincere and pure devotion is gone. Now it's about all these other tertiary, secondary and tertiary subjects instead of sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So if you bring up rapture, everybody freaks out and actually probably everybody would listen because that's all they really care about. Just like I was so grieved by the message that the Lord gave me to share and loosed me to share all those words the last time we gathered together to see how many people are watching that because they don't watch the things about a life in holiness and godliness. They don't watch the sermons about sanctifying your life to Christ. They don't watch the sermons about how to navigate despondency or sor sorrow, about what it means to be a godly man, a warrior priest, or about what it means to be a radiant woman. They don't care about, they want to surround themselves with teachers telling them what their itching ears want to hear. They want the prophecy. They want the sensational. They want the current events. They want the intel. They don't want Jesus. That's what those numbers tell me. And I'm not diminishing the good work. There's good fruit and there's people that are, I'm sure, being challenged to come into repentance or it's causing them to fear the Lord or to be like, oh, goodness, I need to die to the things of the world. I know there's fruit being produced. But when you see the numbers of that thing at 105,000 views, by the way, I don't care. I will never take a census of my kingdom. I know what God did to David when he did that. I don't care about the views. They mean nothing to me. But the numbers are very telling because this sermon will have one one hundredth of the views because I'm talking about a pure heart before the Holy God. That's why it concerns me. It's very concerning. I don't go, praise God, look at how many people are watching that. I go, oh God, do they even care? Are they listening? Or is it causing them to repent? Are they coming back into a pure and sincere devotion to Christ? Are they going, looking at their dispensational counter going, okay, that must mean the rapture's here. As Jamie said, when the new moon rises, I guarantee you that's going on. They've been deceived away from sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And they will not see the face of God. Because they're not pure. They're not listening to the preaching for, uh, from a pure heart. They're not looking at the scriptures from a pure heart. They're not looking at it with purity. It's all impure. It's for themselves. They're lovers of self. And they're actually proud and they're boastful and they're arrogant and they're full of conceit. They want special knowledge, special revelation, special intel so they can exalt themselves over the next guy. They are not pure. Oh, am I getting the point across? 
I guess this is a whole sermon. Sorry, I thought it was a sermonette. Second Peter 3, 11 through 13. Still under guise of purity is the great final act. Purity is a great final act that the Lord is going to do in our time and in our generation. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, it's talking about they deliberately forget, willful, deliberate choice because they love themselves, that the same God who judged the earth with the deluge is coming again to judge it with fire. That's the context. He says, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought we to be? If that's the reality, Chinese troops are coming. I'm certain. I assure you the things I shared with you last time, it is a certainty and it's coming soon. Since everything is going to be destroyed in this way, what kind of people do you think we ought to be? That's the follow on. That's the only thing that that information should draw you into. Oh Lord, search my heart. See if there's any unclean thing in me. Lead me in your way everlasting. Create in me a pure heart, oh God. I confess, I confess, I confess, I repent. I love the world. I'm fearful, I'm anxious, I'm whatever. I'm carnal, I'm prideful, I'm haughty, I'm arrogant, I'm licentious, I'm lazy, I'm thoughtful, I'm complacent. I don't love well, I love myself. It's all about me. And even as I hear these things, I'm going, what about me? What preps do I need? How do I blah, blah, blah? How do I self-preserve this? Are you kidding me? Okay, I digress. Since we know everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought we to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. That's what the information, the information should cause you to do to pursue purity. We ought to live godly and holy lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. What dwells there? Righteousness. Purity underlies righteousness. Purity. That's why blessed are the pure. They're going to see God. Because that's where purity dwells. Because that's where righteousness dwells. Because that's where Christ Jesus dwells. So what kind of people ought we to be in the revelation of all these things that are going on? We ought to pursue these things. Godly, holy lives. Letting the Lord purify in us. Letting the, the word sanctify us and wash us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confessing he's faithful and just to heal you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Every time you confess, as many times as you need to, you just keep doing it in a purity of heart because you want to bless your father. You want to bless your savior. That's why you do it. First John 3, 1 through 3. See what great love the father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason why the world does not know us is it did not know him. Dear children, now we are children of God and what we, ha what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope purify themselves just as he is pure. I'm telling you, it's the culmination of the, all the age will be centered around purity. If you have the hope of the resurrection and the glorification and the new heaven and the new earth and that all this is going to be burned with fire and all the elements are going to be destroyed, even the heavens and the earth and everything in it, knowing this and knowing this hope that you have, all who have this hope purify themselves because they know that that's who he is. You can't get out from under it. And again, in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Therefore, since we have these promises about the resurrection, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for Christ. This is how big a deal the power of purity is. Purity is literally what Christ died for. He died for your purity. Period. Ephesians 5, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself 
up for her for a particular reason. There's only one reason why Christ gave himself up for his church, that he might sanctify her and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blameless. That's why he gave himself up, was so that you can wear a white wedding dress. Did you know that? He literally gave himself up so that you can wear a white dress at the wedding banquet of the lamb. Pure. So that you can be pure. Because that's who he is. And the two are one. If he's in you and you are in him, as he is in the Father, he's in you, then purity is the pursuit of your heart. Purity. To bless the Father, because that's who he is. And he goes, and that's literally why I died, was for the singleness of putting a white dress on you when I come as a Galilean wedding to draw you to the house I prepared for you in advance. Everybody tracking? These are just my thoughts for the morning. Could you imagine if I had a whole week to think? No. <laughs> Thus, the peer of heart ought to have a pursuit for the peer of heart. The pure of heart ought to have a pursuit for purity of heart in all things. The pure in heart ought to have a pursuit for the Lord's heart, which is only ever pure. That's what the pure of heart ought to have. 2 Timothy 2, 20 through 22 says this, In a large house, the, there are not only articles of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some for special purposes, some for common use. Another translation says some for noble uses, some for ignoble uses. Those who cleanse themselves of the latter will be instruments of special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. How many good works? Any. Any good work. Because you're purifying the clay and the wood items, and you have the noble items that are left in the house. So then he says, flee from evil desires of your youth, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call out to the Lord from a pure heart. What are you to pursue? Not just, not just righteousness and faith and love and peace. You're actually to pursue other people who have a pure heart. That's why I told you, it's my constant prayer. Purity. Pure. I want people of a pure heart. Did I say perfect? We're all a hot mess. Welcome to the party. It's awesome. It's kind of funny sometimes. It's so ridiculous how messy we are. But if your heart's pure, I'm like, come sit at my table. I want to break bread with you every day of my life. I don't care. I don't care about your double-mindedness. I don't care that you fall short. I don't care about your insecurities. I don't care about your woundings that you're living out of. If your heart's pure, I want to pursue you in intimate relationship because I know that that's the Lord's heart. I'm not worried about your perfection. I'm worried about your purity. But if you're a liar, if you're a deceiver, if you're envious, if you're jealous, if you're filled with malice, if you're a slander, if you're conceited, if you're arrogant, if you have the form of godliness but deny the power thereof, if you live out from a pursuit of pleasure, if you are self-seeking, if you're self-validating, if you're emotionally predatory, get out of my way. I got no tolerance for that. No tolerance for that. And neither does the Lord. You want to know why? Because God opposes the proud. He, but he gives grace to the humble. That's why. It says, actually, we're even to pursue other people who have a pure heart. Dude, is your heart, what do you want? Do you want the Lord's hand or do you want his face? I want his face. Praise God. Dude, let's, let's like, let's just chat. Let's just hang out. Let's go play in the mountains. I don't care. Let's share a meal. Let's talk about Nephilim. I don't care what you want to talk about. If you have a pure heart, bro, you got me locked in for life. I'm not going anywhere. And you know what? You're going to offend me. And I'm going to offend you. And you're going to blow it. And I'm going to blow it. And we're going to sin against each other. And it's all okay. It's all okay. Because you have a pure heart. And my desire is to have a pure heart because his heart is pure. So let's do it all together. See how simple it is? Now we're being the body. Now we're living out the gospel and it can only be from that foundation of a pure heart. A right juxtaposition versus, so it says, pursue those who, who call on the Lord out from a pure heart. The juxtaposition is 2 Timothy 3. I've already been saying it, right? Mark this, there'll be terrible times. 
People be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash. That means they're emotionally reactionary all the time. That's what it means to be right. They're always emotionally charged to the good or to the negative. They're conceited. They love to talk about how special they are. They're lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Pleasure will always trump God. It's always about their personal pursuit of comfort and pleasure and validation. They have the form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. And do you know what the conclusion of that character attribute is? And it have nothing to do with such people. Nothing to do. Oh, but we're supposed to, we're supposed to, we're supposed to, because that's what the secret friendly church has told you for the last 80 years. That's not what the scripture says. It says have nothing to do with them. And in fact, you pursue those who call out to God in a pure heart and those whose hearts are impure. You're not supposed to continually forbear with them. You're just not. Because God's an opposed to them. You don't get to make those judgments. Don't worry about that. Leave that to the Lord. Just leave that to the Lord. God's going to already oppose to them. Listen, there's nothing hidden that's not going to be disclosed. What you ought to do is pursue those who are calling out to God in a clear heart. Leave them to it. Leave them to it. Leave the Pharisees. Leave the Sadducees. Leave the scribes. Leave the false converts who fought. Remember, there was disciples, but they were not true disciples. There was converts, but not true converts. There is people who had faith, but it wasn't a saving faith. It says many of the Pharisees believed in Jesus, but for fear of being put out of the synagogue, they would not proclaim it before men. They had faith in Jesus. It wasn't a saving faith. There was disciples. They weren't, it wasn't saving discipleship. There's all kinds of things going on in the body. That's why it's like you ought to pursue those who are calling out from God to God with a pure heart. You want to know what the antidote is to a corrupted, untrustworthy, and defiled heart, to an impure heart? The antidote to it? I'll tell you it. It's not my opinion. Have you guys noticed that I typically try to only speak in Scripture because I don't trust myself? You know, that's why. I don't trust my opinions. I don't trust my flesh. I don't trust my woundings. I don't trust me. So we just speak through the word because that's the only thing that's trustworthy, okay? So here's the antidote to a corrupted, untrustworthy, and defiled heart. Psalm 119, 19 through 16. How can a man keep his way pure? I'm t there's not a single thing missing in the scriptures. I love it. Like every question is answered. How do I be pure, God? Has anybody asked that? Lord, how do I walk in purity, God? I'll tell you. How can a man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Remember, the eyes of the Lord range throughout the whole earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Here he says, I know how I can keep my way pure by guarding it according to your words and with my whole heart seeking you. Not a partial heart, not one foot in the kingdom, one foot in the world, not double mindedness, not speaking out of both corners of my mouth, but with my whole heart to seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. See what his desire was? His desire was to bless God. I don't want to sin against you, God. That's a pure heart. I did sin against you. I confess it. That's a pure heart. I repent. That's a pure heart. I'm filled with godly sorrow, not earthly sorrow. That's a pure heart because I don't want to sin against you. I want to bless you. I want my life and my testimony to bless you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips, I declare all the rules of your mouth. And in the way of your testimonies, I delight as much in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your stat statutes and I will not forget your word. That's how you keep your way pure. He told you. Bottom line. Proverbs 17, 3. The crucible is for silver and the furnace for the gold. But the Lord tests the hearts. The Lord tests the hearts of men. The bottom line is, he already knows. Why wouldn't you just walk in purity? He already knows all the secret, hidden, intents. His word is to expose the secret thoughts and intents of your hearts. Everything he does is to test the heart of a man, to expose impurities and to call it into purity because he's coming for a church that is pure and spotless and blameless. 
Blessed are the pure, for they shall see God. That's the bottom line. So then, dear friends, 2 Peter 3, since you're looking forward to this, to the resurrection, to the glorification, to the place where righteousness dwells, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, This, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. The Lord God Almighty is looking for the pure in heart. And as we've talked about the sifting, we've talked about the harvest, we've talked about the suddenly, we've talked about the things that are coming, we've talked about the fact that all the earths are going to be destroyed with fire, all the elements are going to be destroyed with fire. In light of this, what kind of people ought we to be to pursue a pure heart? And the deepest meditations of your thought, you think about somebody, you think about something, you're processing the attributes of life in your prayer, in your religion, in your private time, in your intimate time, in the deepest recesses of your hearts, that because of knowing and understanding this, that we would make every effort, every effort, this is not works, as some people want to claim I preach works. I preach Christ and Him crucified. Have I ever preached works? But the fact that you have been healed and forgiven and cleansed of all righteousness, don't you think you ought to respond appropriately? That's what I'm speaking to. So we make every effort, every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with Him at His coming so we're not ashamed. Purity. Purity. No impure person ought to think that they have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. None. So that's what was on my mind this morning as we seek the face of the Lord and seek to honor him. Because a false purity is a false sense of security. It ain't worth it. You're not fooling anybody. You're not fooling anybody, especially not a holy God. So. For all the online haters who think I'm faking this and that there's nobody in front of me, yell loud enough to pick it up on a lapel mic and say hi to your online church family. Go ahead. Enough with the haters. That's a wrap.